Appendix C. The New Abortionists. Chemical Abortion in Contemporary Culture. An interview with Dr. Thomas Hilgers and Larry Frieders. The following is an intriguing examination of those chemical abortions that masquerade as contraceptives. This presentation explores these crucial topics from both a spiritual and a scientific perspective. Dr. Thomas Hilgers is an OBGYN physician. Larry Frieders is the vice president of Pharmacists for Life. The interviewer is Denny Hartford, director of Vital Signs Ministries. Hartford. Dr. Hilgers, can we begin by discussing, first of all, why Christians should be concerned about what I've referred to as the new abortionists? Hilgers. Well, for a number of years, chemical abortifacients have been available and, in fact, used extensively. But for the most part, people, not just Christians, but people of all faiths and backgrounds, haven't been aware of it. There's a profound amount of ignorance out there with regard to the abortion effects of birth control pills and other chemicals that are on the market. Hartford Larry, I know that in your role as a professional pharmacist, you agree that there is a tremendous amount of confusion and even misinformation on the subject. What do you think are some of the initial problems that we have to address with the issue? Frieders well, when you look at the literature and the information that's available on the birth control pill, for example, you'll find that the facts are there. The package inserts, the physician's desk reference, a variety of sources of information, all very specifically state what these oral contraceptives do. They are indicated only for the prevention of pregnancy. And there are three mechanisms of how the birth control pills work. And they're quite well established. They've been known for years. The most commonly portrayed method is that it interferes with ovulation. So if you don't have a viable egg being produced, you're not going to get pregnant. This action is certainly a type of contraception. However, when that fails, and it does fail, the backup mechanisms by which pregnancies are avoided come into play. Obviously, the one backup mechanism that we're most concerned with is the one that changes the woman's body in such a way that if there is a new life, that tiny human loses the ability to implant and then grow and be nourished by the mother. The facts are clear, and we've all known them intellectually. I learned them in school. I had to answer those questions in my state board pharmacy exam. The problem was getting that knowledge from my intellect down to where it became part of who I am. I had to accept the fact that I was participating in the sale and distribution of a product, a product that was, in fact, causing the loss of life. So it's not that the knowledge isn't there, but rather that there's something keeping that knowledge from descending from one's intellect down into the area of your heart where you can recognize the awesome tragedies that are happening. Hartford. Dr. Hilders, when we mention chemical abortion, many people will think of RU486, mifepristone, or they may even think of a third world country with some witch doctor or native me medicine practitioner giving an expectant mother drugs for abortion. But the issue is much broader. We're talking about a whole new generation of drugs that are killing unborn children. Hilgers. Indeed. Of course, the use of oral contraceptives and intrauterine devices are the main two abortifacients that have been here in the United States for many, many years. I wrote a paper 20 years ago detailing the abortifacient effects of the intrauterine device. The basic facts about life or death involved in that issue have not changed at all. And what Mr. Frieders has said about the long-standing knowledge of the birth control pill's adverse effects on the lining of the uterus is certainly true. Now, we've seen the recent FDA approval of Norplant, one of the newer implantable so-called contraceptives, which has, as one of its primary mechanisms, the disturbance of the lining of the uterus. When this lining is injured, it is done for the specific purpose of destroying the new life that is created if conception occurs, and with Norplant ovulation and conception probably occurs an alarming percentage of the time. Hartford. Larry, in order to understand these things fully, we may have to go back to some basic biology, specifically the scientific facts surrounding the beginning of human life. What is conception? And at what point in the process of the development of the child do the drugs and devices actually interfere to end a human life? Frieders. 
The science is actually pretty well known. There is only one point in time when new life is created, and that's when there are 23 chromosomes from mom and 23 chromosomes from dad that come together miraculously and create a new cell containing 46 chromosomes. It is an organism unlike any that's ever existed in the past, and totally unlike anything that will ever exist again. It is a human being. Now, during the 7 to 10 days that this new life is progressing down the fallopian tube, it is growing in size continuously. It is doubling and doubling and doubling until it reaches a point where it needs to attach to the mother's uterus in order to gain additional nourishment from her blood supply. But at no time does this still very tiny human child ever become part of the woman's body. Nor is the mother part of the child. The mother is providing nourishment and providing a safe and warm place for the baby to survive. The blood supplies are totally different. They do not share chemical activities of the body. Mother may be sick, baby may be healthy. There is not a one-to-one -one relationship. So at no time does the baby become part of mom. That's the physiology that so obviously contradicts the rhetoric of abortion when people are talking merely about the rights of women. That little life is not a part of the mother. Therefore, the mother does not have a moral right to have the other person killed. Hartford. Dr. Hilgers, at what point then do we see the drugs interrupting this process? I know that the American Medical Association attempted a few years ago to actually redefine conception in order to allow for an easier acceptance of these drugs. Could you discuss that and tell us exactly how abortions are occurring through the use of abortifacient chemicals? Hilgers. The chemical abortions we are speaking of here take place at the point where implantation occurs, that is, in the lining of the uterus. That is, as Mr. Frieders said, seven to nine days following conception. And yes, the American Medical Association and other organizations did try to redefine the beginning of human life specifically to help sell abortifacient devices and drugs. What they did was reject the traditionally accepted and scientifically authenticated definition, namely conception, and substitute a belief that life did not, quote, begin until implantation or even later. It was a purely political decision, and obviously it was not based on fact. The redefinition of the beginning of life was actually done to redefine abortion in hopes that these devices, like the IUD and drugs like birth control pills, would no longer be thought of as abortive. It's interesting to note that the redefinition began in the 60s with the intrauterine device and the concerns about the religious groups in Pakistan and India particularly, which are non-Christian religions but which have a deep respect for life and are very much opposed to abortion. The manufacturers of the devices and their friends were worried these devices would not be well accepted in these cultures, so the sales pitch ignored science and centered on changing language instead. Hartford. What we are learning here is that the developing human child, created as Christians testify in the image and likeness of God, is in effect left homeless, not being able to implant in the uterus, and is thus left to die an ignoble and secret death. Through the chemicals and the IUDs, we therefore have the termination of a life. We have an abortion. Gentlemen, why is this not common knowledge? You both have said that this information has been around, that it is in black and white in the physician's desk reference, and even in the literature of the manufacturers. Why then is there so much misinformation, even from Christian physicians, the clergy, and others about these crucial matters? Hilgers. I must say that a large amount of it comes from the physicians themselves. Physicians, for the most part, have simply denied that these devices are abortive. With regard to the birth control pill, for example, they will argue that most of the time they act as contraceptives, which is probably true. But at the same time, they deny that at least some of the time they are clearly abortifacient. This denial has become part of their practice to the extent where it is no longer a part of their ethical sensitivity. When talking to women about any of these devices and chemicals, their presentation avoids telling the patient about the possibility that they might be abortive. So the physicians, in order to justify their own practices, have kept this information from people.
Part of our responsibility is to bring that information to people so they can begin to look at this more carefully and make moral and ethically true decisions. Hartford. Larry, I know that you haven't undergone a spiritual conversion when it comes to dealing with chemical abortion. In your own practice, you came to the decision that you no longer were going to merely oppose so-called birth control pills in an abstract way, but you were not going to sell them in your store. Could you tell us briefly how that conversion occurred in your life? Freeders. Well, Denny, I'm happy to talk about that. My thinking was first challenged around 1986 or 1987. At that time, there had been a convict executed in Texas, and I read a letter to the editor in one of the pharmacy journals from a person who was condemning the act of using medicines, things that are supposed to heal, to kill. You see, they have to have a pharmacist prepare the compound and administer it. The person who wrote this letter of opposition was a man named Bo Kuhar, who I learned was the president of a group called Pharmacists for Life. I contacted him about that issue. In subsequent conversations, he made me aware of the fact that involvement with birth control pills also created alarming moral problems. Even though I knew the science in an intellectual sense, the ramifications of the truth started to become clearer to me. At that time, I was still selling birth control pills. I figured, even if they were bad, if customers don't buy them from me, they'll buy them from someone else, and it's not my job to impose my morality on the, these customers, etc., etc. All the line of basically illogical rhetoric that people use. But I had people praying for me, and I was attending church on a regular basis at that time. It became more and more obvious that the more I sold these things, the more I felt torn. I knew I was doing something contrary to my Christian beliefs. Then, I was put in touch with more pharmacists who had the same experience and who had stopped selling the pills. Mr. Kuhar stopped selling them in his store. A fellow named Paul Reckenbauch in Ohio discontinued the sale of them in his store. Another fellow named Phil Brooks, and I contacted them all and talked to them. Not once did anybody order me to stop. They all kindly said that was a decision that was mine to make. They all did say, however, that they would pray for me. They promised to ask God for wisdom and courage for me. The last conversation I had was in a small prayer group, just sitting around talking with some people. And someone said, well, you know what you have to do. So we discontinued the sale. We were filling anywhere between 100 to 200 prescriptions a month for the pill, and we prepared a letter to physicians and customers letting everyone know what we were going to do and when we were going to do it, and then we did it. The first contact I had with someone coming for a birth control pill was a young family, a newly married Jewish couple. They tentatively handed me their prescription, and I thought, this is it. This is my first consultation telling someone I can't do this. So I got my packet of information, and I asked the young couple to go with me to my desk area in the back. I began to explain to them why I no longer sold the pills, and I had my information on natural family planning that I was ready to offer when the young girl broke down sobbing almost hysterically. At that time, I felt I had perhaps made a mistake. I shot up a quick prayer. Lord, this is not a good start for this change in my life. It could have been easier, couldn't it? But as it turns out, the girl explained that her mother had breast cancer, and her aunt had died of cancer. She did not have all the knowledge, but she believed that birth control pills somehow had contributed to certain types of cancers, and so she had been really afraid of them. The tears were actually tears of relief, and she was very happy to know that somebody said, I don't think you ought to take those things. After that point, it was all easy. I had critics call and complain. I had letters written, but essentially it got easier. Hartford. Dr. Hilgers, many people would say that Mr. Frieders overreacted in his decision not to sell any birth control pills. They might argue that their own doctor prescribes birth control pills, but only the types that do not endanger the unborn. Are there any birth control pills out there that do not have this potential to abort a developing child? Hilgers. Denny, there are none. 
At my last count, in looking at the Physician's Desk Reference, which is the big book that all doctors possess, which describes all the medicines that are on the market, there were 44 different types of birth control pills. You see, when we talk about the birth control pill, we are not talking about the same pill. At least 44 different ones exist, and they have different con concentrations of chemicals that make them work. None of these so-called birth control pills have a mechanism which is completely contraceptive. Put the other way around. All birth control pills available have a mechanism which disturbs or disintegrates the lining of the uterus to the extent that the possibility of abortion exists when breakthrough ovulation occurs. Hartford. Regarding the chances of quote-unquote breakthrough ovulation, Dr. Hilgers, just how high could that figure be? Hilgers. I would say that most birth control pills on the market have anywhere from a 4% to a 10% chance of allowing breakthrough ovulation. There are pills called mini pills, which contain only a progesterone-like hormone, where the percentage age, uh, percentage of ovulations are probably more in the 50 to 60% range, but those are not used as commonly. So the most common birth control pill probably is in the range of 2 to 10%. Hartford. It can hardly be disputed that local pastors encountered a dramatically different attitude to children in their premarital counseling than what existed even a generation ago. I'm sure that both of you have encountered this in your own fields as well. You certainly have had to deal with men and women who expect from you advice on birth control. Dr. Hilgers, how do you deal with what is at its base an anti-child bias? What do you say to them? Hilgers, Denny, my job is rather easy in this respect because in about two minutes I can describe for them how a woman's body itself can tell them with remarkable accuracy when she is fertile and when she is not fertile. For the most part, my patients are like men and women throughout the West. That is, they are unaware of the inherent dangers of birth control pills and devices. People often have this notion that's been sold for many years that the much derided calendar rhythm method of some 40 years ago doesn't work. But that's irrelevant to a discussion of modern methods. Indeed, contemporary methods of natural family planning, which carefully define the times of a woman's fertility and infertility, are very, very effective for both achieving and avoiding pregnancy. So, again, Denny, my job is pretty easy because it involves good news about their health their emotional and spiritual lives, and their responsibilities. They're often rather startled because nobody's ever told them this before, but generally, they are very happy to learn the facts. And we then build on that secure foundation. Hartford. Your advice must be unlike that of many OBGYNs, isn't it? Hilgers. I'm afraid so. It has occurred to me recently that birth control pills are probably the major medicine that gynecologists prescribe. People usually think of the pill as just for contraceptive purposes, but doctors prescribe them for ovarian cysts, to eliminate unusual bleeding, to regulate the cycle when the cycle might be too long or too short, to treat uh, endometriosis, to treat premenstrual tension syndrome, and so on. There's a variety of conditions that bring a patient into the gynecologist, and that doctor will often put them on birth control pill to solve it. But you see, the birth control pill doesn't solve any of that. It only suppresses the system. It only covers up or disguises the underlying cause of all these different kinds of problems. This is a tremendous tragedy. I haven't been involved in the prescription of birth control pills for many years. I have instead been studying all of this, so that now we can offer genuine treatments for these disorders. By using a health maintenance system, we can tell if women have ovarian cysts, we can tell if they have unusual bleeding, and what the causes are. If they have premenstrual syndrome, for, for instance, we can cooperatively treat their menstrual cycles and ovulation cycles in a way that's not merely suppressive, or worse yet, actually destructive. So it's a whole new way, really, of practicing medicine, and it is very exciting and very rewarding. It uses the skills and talents that I've spent a lot of time trying to learn over many years in a way that's really constructive to my patients. Hartford. Larry, you also take a position on the pill, which is unpopular with many in your profession. 
You argue effectively, however, that since the pill is not a medicine, it is actually a strange thing for pharmacists to prescribe. Freeders, you're right. Dr. Hilger's point is a very important one. Not one of the maladies for which the pill is commonly prescribed is documented in the official literature or in the package inserts. So to use those pills for something other than its only indication, which of course is to prevent pregnancy, is to use it inappropriately, and one might argue in this uh, litigious society might even be to use it illegally. Again, the FDA is very specific about what the pill can be used for, and there's only one indication. So it puts the pharmacist in an unusual situation. Here we are dispensing things in good faith, on the orders of a doctor, and in some cases the drugs are being used inappropriately. Hartford, what about the commercial strength of the birth control industry? The dollars involved here must be incredible. Freeders, well look, you have 28 little pills. They're very small, and I'm sure that they do not cost much to make. However, they sell for around 20 bucks or more. I've extrapolated that, and it runs to about three or three and a half billion dollars a year in the United States. So we're up against a very large financial interest indeed. I would think gross profits on these products are probably in the range of 75% or more. So when you make a decision not to sell pills, or when you make a decision not to prescribe pills, or for that matter, when you make a decision to unequivocally avoid using the pill, you are opening yourself up to an awful lot of powerful criticism. And what you become to your peers, then, is a very powerful mirror. Once somebody sees you responding positively to the truth, in step with the will of the Lord, it hurts them. And they can turn that hurt into anger, and before long, they're coming after you. Hartford. So one of the reasons for the misinformation and the confusion is that we're actually opposing a very powerful and entrenched industry, over a $3 billion a year industry. Obviously, there is a very lucrative market there that the industry doesn't want disturbed. Hilgers. It influences the medical profession's practice significantly, Denny. Several years ago, I did a study on the amount of advertising dollars that went into the professional journals. We looked at the five major journals of obstetrics and gynecology. 25% of all the advertising of those journals was provided by the contraceptive industry. Millions of dollars go to those journals to support these advertisements and, of course, support the journals and the staff, which in turn promote contraceptives in their reporting and editorial policy. The numbers of dollars and the international contraceptive, contraceptive industrialization that has gone on in the last 25 years or 30 years is really incredible. This is really big time business. There's no question about that. Hartford. Deborah Evans, a prominent evangelical author who deals extensively with medical ethics in her work, made the statement recently that it's going to be very difficult to picket a woman's medicine cabinet. Her point was to emphasize the tremendous difficulties facing the pro-life community as they seek to protect the unborn from the waves of chemical abortions that are now upon us. It seems that groups like Pharmacists for Life and researchers and physicians like yourself, Dr. Hilgers, may well end up being key warriors in a new battle for the sanctity of human life. Hilgers. Over the last several years, the threat posed by RU486 which has been talked about a lot and is recognized by everybody as an abortive chemical, is that it will change the whole abortion industry to a microscopic abortion industry and actually eliminate the need for surgical abortions. The sort of odd thing about that is this microscopic abortion business has been around for a long time. And our role, it seems to me, is primarily to provide education, but also to be able to provide moral leadership to our colleagues Men and women need to understand that Christian decision-making must be in full accord with the truth. Education is very important because, as we've said, we're looking forward to a, we're looking at a profound amount of ignorance on these issues. Hartford. Gentlemen, let me quickly sum up here. Through surgical abortion, just in the United States alone, we are destroying over 4,000 children every day. Churches have begun to decry the violence, the barbaric inhumanity represented by the knives and suction machines of the abortionists. However, 
What we have learned here is that the devil is destroying other innocent victims, but through more secret and subtle ways. Make no mistake, however, what we have been exploring here is also abortion. It is no less sinister a crime, not only against man, but certainly against God, even though the weapons employed are the more socially acceptable ones of chemicals or devices. We want to encourage Christians before God to look very carefully at both the scientific and the spiritual evidence and make certain that your personal and public witness to the sanctity of all human life is comprehensive. If there has been sin, confess to the forgiving Christ of the cross and sin no more. If there has been cowardice and ignorance, forsake them now and walk in the healing light and love of the Savior. Human life is not something with which we can gamble. Reprinted with permission, Life Advocate Magazine, March 1994.